Welcome to the Fruitful Jungle. The Fruitful Jungle was a vast network of monstrous and narrow rainforests located in equatorial North Myrusa. Characterized by stretches of floor comprised primarily of trees descended from pepper plants and epiphytes descended from kiwi plants. As a tropical biome, the climate was hot and humid with frequent rainfall. Although the soil at the forest floor was nutrient poor due to the large amount of vegetation, this is similar to rainforests such as the Amazon and Congo on Earth. Although the colorful animals you might have seen flying throughout the jungle at first glance were called birds, they are actually terrestrial nudibranchs of the clade Malacoptera, which includes the white cherubranch and its descendants. Like many other land-dwelling gastropods, Malacopterans thrive in moist environments, including rainforests. Because very few animals around this time could fly, these four-winged slugs ruled the skies of their lush habitat. Among the Malacopterans, one of the more numerous families was the Brachiopsids, more commonly known as Pickups, who possessed well-developed oral tentacles capable of manipulating their environment. The blue-breasted Pickup was a species superficially similar to a small parrot, lacking the venom of its ancestors to shift and die from jellyfish to fruit. When non-flight, the slug clumsily ambled about the treetops, but its four broad wings bestowed it with incredible grace and agility in the air. The blue-breasted pickup had a wingspan of up to 30 centimeters, or about 12 inches, which is just as large as a parakeet. Most pickups only travel to the forest floor to lay their eggs, which are then buried under the soil. Newborns of this species were not the size of a jelly bean, but born fully developed. In order to properly control their appendages, the Brachiopsis develops more complex brains, with the added side effect of increased intelligence, potentially rivaling many species of cephalopod. The magenta pickup was a journalist omnivore known for using tools to its advantage, with some individuals being observed using sticks to probe for caterpillars born through tree bark. Although this level of intelligence is astonishing among mollusks as a whole, it's well within the norm for Brachiopsids. The magenta pickup was comparable in size to a large crow, reaching up to 3 feet or a little over 91 centimeters in wingspan, and a weight of up to 7 pounds. Newborns hatched from their eggs with a wingspan of up to an inch, or about 3 centimeters. Other Brachiopsids remained carnivores as they continued to diversify. The hooked pickup was an apex predator with pointed wings and recurved claw-like structures on its oral tentacles. While just as intelligent as other Brachiopsid species, it didn't need tools to hunt and relied mostly on its powerful tentacles to restrain its quarry. Some of its preferred prey items included other pickups, which it gradually ate alive by rasping away at them with its radula while they were secured in its tentacles. When mature, the hooked pickup bore a wingspan of up to 5 feet or about 152 centimeters, and weighed up to 14 pounds, with its size rivaling that of a hyacinth macaw. Newly hatched pickups measured a little over 2 inches, or about 5 centimeters in wingspan. While Malacopterans were the dominant flyers in the fruitful jungle, they lacked outright dominion over their habitat. The undisputed rulers of this stretch of rainforest were the Selachipods, as they have always been since the Revolta scene. The majority of rainforest fauna consisted of squalosaurs and chelicarcharids, whereas carcarathias were comparatively rare and even non-existent in several areas, due to the foliage being too dense for their large bodies to traverse. While the fruitful jungle was dominated by squalosaurs, many chelicarcharid species managed to find a foothold in this climate. Carcarocyan didactylus was an arboreal measle carnivore that supplemented its diet of smaller animals with fruit. Despite its name, it was more similar to a primate than a dog, bearing a pseudo-thumb on each forelimb as opposed to the typical monodactyl foot arrangement. This appendage allowed Carcarocyon a better grip on the trees. Carcarocyon didactylus can reach a maximum adult size of up to a meter, or a little over three feet in length. While superficially mammalian in appearance, it still laid eggs in nests made from hollows in the trees, with newborn pups measuring around half a foot in body length. Other chelicarcharids continue to live closer to the forest floor. Spinopelta macron, a relatively smaller porcopelta, was one of the largest rainforest herbivores in the absence of carcarotheres. Alongside a more well-developed layer of armor, it bore massive spikes on its shoulders and hips for added defense, similar to the extinct nodosaurs. 
Spinal Pelter can use these growths to jab unlucky carnivores or anchor itself to the ground, preventing a predator from exposing its vulnerable belly. Spinal Pelter Macron was typically around the same size as Carcharos Scion at around a meter long, although elderly individuals have been growing to double that size nearly 7 feet in length. Spinal Pelter eggs were laid on the ground and calves were born measuring 4 inches in length. One of the most successful predator clays of the fruitful jungle was the assemblage of Carcharophonids. Richardson's panther was as agile as his relative Carcharophonius, if far less likely to stand on two legs. It was an excellent climber and frequently rested in trees when not hunting for prey. The panther's spied pattern helped break up its outline and camouflage itself as it patrolled the rainforest for prey, somewhat like the rosette patterns of leopards and jaguars on Earth. Richardson's panther was among the largest predators of the fruitful jungle, reaching at most 10 feet or 3 meters in length, or slightly larger than an African leopard. Its pups hatched from their eggs at about 8 inches from snout to tail, and were cared for by their mother until they became some adults. Some predators have evolved aggressive mimicry, luring in prey by imitating objects of interest. The red-backed peppertail, an animal closely related to carcarophonids, have vestigial tail fin that resembled a chili pepper, which it used to hunt for as prey. Unlike its relatives, the pepper tail was a wholly arboreal among a quadruped. Its claws were used to both cling to trees and restrain its victims, and individuals have been commonly observed sharpening them on tree bark. The red-backed pepper tail was fairly small, maxing out at about five feet or a meter and a half from snout to tail, rivaling an ocelot in length. Freshly hatched pepper-tailed pups grew typically around three inches long and raised in their nests, which were built from foliage and helped conceal the growing young from predators. Although derived squall sores made up a large part of the jungle's fauna community, many lizard-like forms still existed. Rinscale's wobiguana was an arboreal frugivore that scoured the treetops for peppers and kiwi fruit, bearing teeth adapted for shearing through the soft flesh. When threatened by a predator, the animal's first instinct was to flee, as it could afford to expend large amounts of energy to its high-sugar diet. The wobiguana's dorsal fins become a sail used for thermoregulation. Rinscale's wobiguana rivaled its earth analog, the green iguana, in length, reaching over 2 meters or a little under 7 feet in length. Wobiguana pups were born with undeveloped dorsal sails and measure around 3 inches in length when freshly hatched. The pepper plants descended from the first Squalosian colonists inherited the ability to produce capsaicin, a toxin that acts as a deterrent against mammals and is responsible for the spicy taste of chili peppers. As Squalosia lacks mammals, many plants of the fruitful jungle evolved to produce a structurally distinct variant capable of affecting salachipods, which has been dubbed capsaicin S. On the left is the molecular structure of a regular capsaicin molecule, while on the right, is the structure of capsaicin S. Some species of animals, however, have evolved to exploit capsaicin S as a defense mechanism. The squalosaur Picantosaurus infernus was a specialist frugivore that only eats peppers with high concentrations of capsaicin S, having involved an immunity to the toxin's ill effects. This diet made the animal poisonous to other slatchipods, illuminating the need for camouflage. Its bright red aposematic coloration served to associate with danger as if to say, You eat me, and I'll burn your throat. Picantosaurus infernus is relatively small, reaching a maximum body size of 7 inches, or close to 18 centimeters, rivaling a large crested gecko. Its pups were born without poison and started accumulating after their first meal, measuring 2.5 inches in length upon birth. Although several animals became poisonous to avoid predation, several lineages instead evolved to administer venom. The spotty fang spine was a primitive eucalactopod whose vestigial dorsal fin evolved into a ridge adorned with spines that delivered neurotoxic venom when stepped on, hence its humorous nickname of Lego Block Lizard. A single dose could kill a human being in as little as 30 minutes. The animal's needle like teeth were suited for gripping slippery prey such as gastropods. The spotty fang spine grew to a length of 8 inches, or a little over 20 centimeters, and weighed 52 grams, 
or a little over a tenth of a pound. Unlike its toxic contemporary Picantosaurus, Fang spine pups are born with a full payload of venom and measure around three inches upon hatching. As several animals became toxic and developed bright colors, this opened up the avenue for Batesian mimicry, where harmless animals evolved to resemble harmful ones. Antoxicanthus aurum was a species of squalosaur that evolved to resemble the thigh fang spine, bearing a similar mottled gold pattern and distinct dorsal spines, although it lacked venom altogether. It was more generalized in its diet than the fang spine, hunting many different species of small invertebrate. Antoxicanthus aurum grew within size ranges comparable to its model, albeit around half an inch shorter and three grams heavier. Antoxicanthus pups hatched bearing a thinner head than adults and an average body length of 2 inches from snout to tail. Besides the ubiquitous Malacopterans, many other invertebrate species call the fruitful jungle home, including spiders, moths, isopods, and other mosques. Most similar to their relatives across other parts of Squalosia, these endemic fauna were at the same time quite distinct due to their many adaptations for life in the tropical rainforest. While Salachopods remained the dominant fauna of the fruitful jungle, many Papalophine species came into their own as serpentine predators. Dendrovermis viridis was a specialized hunter of flying animals, using its posterior end to hang off of tree branches such that it resembled a vine. When a hapless animal stumbled upon it, Dendrovermis would wrap its body around its victim, finishing it off with a fatal bite. Because it couldn't swallow prey whole like a snake would, it was a very messy eater. Dendrovermis viridis was as long as an Amazonian giant centipede, reaching 30 centimeters or slightly below a foot in body length. It wove a silken egg sac around its brood to help protect them from predators, producing hundreds of young, each a third of an inch long upon hatching. Other papalophines found niches to exploit at ground level, blossoming to gargantuan sizes. The Queet's caterpython was among the largest boasting serrated mandibles built for cutting through flesh. Like most of its kind, it was a powerful constrictor that killed by mobilizing its prey and biting into it, while it preferred to wait until its prey was weak and out of air to minimize the risk of hurting itself trying to kill it. Unlike Dendrovermis, the Caterpython didn't have to worry about dropping its meals. The Queen's Caterpython, while unusually gigantic by insect standards, was still quite small at only a meter in length, similar to Carcara scion and Spinal Pelta. Its eggs were laid in tunnels dug out in the soil and lined with silk by the mother, with the young emerging ready to hunt despite only being around three inches in length. Onica bracket spiders of the Moshacene were just as much at home in the rainforest as other invertebrates. Brachyophonius vividens was a colorful species that swung around the trees like an arachnine gibbon. Although it lacked powerful muscles, Brachyphonius can propel itself at incredible speeds with hydraulic pressure, with its foreland optimized for brachiating, or swinging, through the trees, the task of securing prey became relegated to the spider's second pair of limbs. Brachyphonius vividens was one of the largest spiders in Smolos' history, bearing a length of about 18 inches, or about 46 centimeters, which is comparable to a ring-tailed lemur. Spiderlings of this species, born at the size of a skittle, were cared for by the mother and raised in a nursery woven from silk and leaves. Neotrilobites, already an exceedingly common group of animals, were plentiful in the fruitful jungle. The flame-flanked neotrilobite was particularly notable for the orange stripes on its shell, from which it gets its name. It was adaptable enough to live on the forest floor, understory, and canopy without issue. In fact, Many neotrilobite colonies have been sighted migrating between layers during times of especially immense downpour. The isopod primarily fed on fallen fruit, both fresh and rancid. The flame-flanked neotrilobite measured up to 7 inches, or close to 18 centimeters in length, comparable to a large standard-issue computer mouse. Baby neotrilobites of this species were around a fourth of an inch when newly born, being pale in color, but slowly darkening its shell with each malt. Although Malacopterans represented many tropical slug species, other clays, like the Viperolum acids, existed alongside them. 
Bristlin's Ragulero was even more snake-like than ancestral species, but featured unique adaptations to arboreal life. It gets its name from the structure of Ragula, which has evolved to dart out at prey in a manner similar to the cone snails crawling Mount Squalos' waterways. It avoided competition with the similarly serpentine Dendrovermis by targeting flightless prey. Bristlin's Ragulero could reach lengths of up to 10 inches, or around 25 centimeters, which translates to the body size of a giant day gecko. Newborns of this species could reach a little under an inch and, like most viperlamacids, were born venomous. One group of pepper descendants remained small compared to the massive trees spanning much of the rainforest, instead evolving to some of Squalos' first carnivorous plants. The red prison plant was an epiphyte whose top crown of leaves has adapted to a snap trap similar to those of Venus flytraps. Capable of enveloping prey as large as a blue-breasted pickup when mature, the leaves are quickly clothed when the unsuspecting quarry brushes up against the plant's trigger hairs. The floor and treetops of the fruitful jungle were dominated by salachipods, primarily members of the clade Squalosauria, and to a lesser extent, Chilocarcarida. As none of these animals have yet developed any adaptations for flight, the skies belong to the Malacopterans. However, other invertebrates manage to fill some of the more unorthodox niches left vacant by their more prevalent com contemporaries. In particular, clays that weren't hit especially hard by the aftermath of the Snapian extinction event, including the Papalophines and Viperella mastids, became prolific predators in spite of the heavy competition from Salachipods. Note that this video doesn't detail every organism native of the fruitful jungle, only the ones that best reflect the general ecology of the bio. If you don't understand what I just showed you all, you can always access the Google Doc, Sporecast, or Discord for the project for more detailed information. The links are posted in the description. If you have any questions pertaining to the project, I will gladly answer them to the best of my ability in the comment section. On the next episode, we'll delve into the Ferocitine period, where the ecosystems begin to stabilize and several Salachopod species evolve beyond being constrained to dry land. I'll see you all next time.